the recording. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alan Sherman, um, professor of computer science. We're now starting the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab today. It's our privilege to have RJ Joyce, who's a PhD student at UMBC, speak about some of his work in malware analysis, specifically uh, benchmarking data sets. Um, we continue to recruit for the SFS scholarship program and a week from today, 12 to 1 in ITE 325, we're going to have an open house with some pizza um, to answer any questions um, people may have about the SFS scholarship program. It's a great deal um, for those who want to work for government, it includes full tuition and fees and a stipend of $20, $27,000 per year plus more, including professional expenses. Uh, a week from tomorrow is the full CDL hike. Um, we're gonna hike Old Rag, Rag Mountain um, starting there at 10 a.m. Hope to see some of you there. Okay, without further ado, um, let's um, begin. All right, hi, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so as Dr. Sherman said, I'm RJ Joyce. I'm a PhD candidate here at UMBC. Um, and this is work that was done jointly between UMBC, um, my employer, Booz Allen Hamilton, and the Laboratory for Physical Sciences. Um, so I did this work with my advisor, Dr. Nicholas, uh, my co-advisor, Dr. Raff, and then Jim Holt from LPS. And the goal of this research was to create benchmark data sets of malware for um, uncommon malware classification tasks. Um, so to kind of introduce those, Um, in prior malware research, um, when we are doing malware classification, it's mainly focused on two classification problems. The first one is by far the most prevalent, um, trying to classify whether a given file is benign or malicious. And we usually refer to this as malware detection. Um, and then the second most common classification task that research focuses on is what we call malware family classification. Um, a malware family is a group of files that are all derived from a common lineage or a common shared source code. And you may have heard of the names of very common malware families. So for example, um, Stuxnet is a very common family. Uh, it's a, a malware worm that was used for targeting um, industrial control systems. Uh, you may have heard of like a banking trojan called Zeus. So the Zeus banking trojan is another malware family or the WannaCry ransomware. But we give these names to families to track um, basically essentially one type of malware as it evolves and as the author makes changes to it. And there's tens of thousands of malware families out there. So the challenge is, can we distinguish um, one family from another and, and match it up with the correct name? And these are both important tasks to do, but um, there's other classification tasks that we, are, we believe are important, but that um, research does not explore very thoroughly and needs to get more attention. Um, the main one of these is, classification by malware category or malware behavior. So for example, can we tell if this, you know, given the fact that we know that this file is malware, can we tell, um, you know, is it ransomware? Is it a banking trojan? Is it a worm? Is it a file infector? Um, is it a keylogger? Does it perform certain behaviors like privilege escalation or communicating over the network? Um, and we'd call this a um, one of our four identified classification tasks. Um, another one is, um, classification by the platform, so like the architecture um, that the malware targets or the, the operating system, like is it targeting Windows or Linux or Android, um, as well as classifying by programming language in some cases. So like, is it written in C or C++ or um, Rust or Go or Python? Or is it, um, you know, for example, like a PDF document or an Office document, or is it like HTML? So identifying Kind of like the file format and the language used for writing the malware is another very important task that is underexplored. Um, another one is um, in some cases malware may use vulnerabilities for um, um, for either um, they may exploit vulnerabilities for either gaining access to a system or for escalating privileges or for some certain other purposes. But those would be the main ones. And can we identify which vulnerability? the malware exploited. And this may give us an idea of um, how the malware gained access or how it gained privilege or other important details about the malware. And then finally, um, this is 
this may be less familiar to some of you, but um, most malware nowadays is obfuscated using something called a packer. So a packer is a piece of software that essentially like bundles up the malware so you can't directly investigate its code. Um, you have to unpack the malware by running it and dumping the malware from memory to disk um, before you can investigate what the malware source code was. And it basically makes it harder to perform static analysis. And there's a lot of common packers out there, some commercial, some kind of made um, custom by the malware author. And identifying the packer used to pack the malware can help you, for one, possibly automatically unpack it, which a lot of antivirus products rely on, or um, possibly identify certain types of malware if they were using a unique packer. Does anyone have any questions about these tasks before we move on? Okay. Um, and so while there are data sets for classifying between benign malicious or for classifying by family, um, labeled data for the remaining four tasks that we identified is either limited or non-existent. Um, so the only current publicly available data set that supports any of these tasks is the Sorel data set. Um, it has 20 million malware or 20 million files in it, of which about 10 million are malicious. And those 10 million malicious files are tagged according to 11 different malware behaviors. Things like, is it ransomware? Does it do denial of service? Um, you know, is it uh, a key logger? Things like that. Uh, but this is very limited. Malware, ex uh, malware exhibits far, far more than 11 behaviors. Um, and it's not fully representative of, you know, truly what's going on, right? Um, there's a very old data set um, labeled by vulnerability, but it's nearly 10 years old now, and it was actually taken down. It's no longer public. Uh, and then we're not aware of any um, public data sets labeled by platform that the malware targets or by the packer that was used. So our main goal is we want to create this data set. And the way we're going to create this is by aggregating information from different antivirus products. Um, this is generally how these labels are obtained, um, is you take a malware sample, you take a bunch of different antivirus products, you scan the malware with all of those antivirus products, and you collect what each antivirus says about it. Um, so for example, I could scan a malicious file with um, like Norton antivirus, and Norton would output what we call an antivirus label, which describes what it thinks the malware is. So um, if I annotate this, this would be an output from one antivirus product for a particular file. We'd scan that same file with like a second antivirus product. So maybe um, the first one's like Norton antivirus, the second one is like Windows Defender, and the third one is like, um, I don't know, like Kaspersky, and the fourth one is Trend Micro, and so on. Um, so again, the idea is we're going to scan one file with a large collection of antivirus products and collect all of their outputs. Um, so on the right here, you can see like a, a fake result where nine different antivirus products detect this one file as malware and what each of them says about it. Um, you'll notice that each of these have different formats, different naming conventions, and different types of information in them. So one of the main challenges here is aggregating this information and making sense of it. Um, so you can see here that um, these three antiviruses call the malware by a family name that's similar to Andromeda or Androm. Um, a couple others detected as a family called Gamaru, and another one detected as a family called Wachos. And then three others don't have any family information in them, but they have more generic information. Um, you know, it thinks it's a Trojan or a backdoor. Um, this one just says it's malware, and it was detected using some kind of like machine learning method just for distinguishing malware versus benign. Um, and this one's a more general, like it says behaves like, so it thinks it's similar to a um, a banking Trojan called Zbot, but it's hard to trust this label because it's indicating that it's from a heuristic, right? Um, so a few challenges here, I just noticed that, or I just noted that there's different formats being used, different naming conventions. So like TR and Trojan and TRJ, all indicate that this malware is a Trojan, but each antivirus product uses a different word for it, right? Um, same thing with, you can see here that some antivirus labels identify the target platform. So it's targeting Windows 32-bit architecture. Um, but there's again, different names for these. Um, and it turns out 
for like the families, like even then we call these aliases. So we say that these tokens mean the same thing, but um, but antivirus products have slightly different or, or possibly very different names that mean the same exact thing, right? Um, at most, um, at the end of most antivirus labels is what we call a suffix. This is like additional information generally used to identify the specific detection technology used by the antivirus uh, product for detecting the malware. So for example, if they have multiple different signatures for detecting the same family or the same activity, um, this suffix will identify which particular um, technology detected the malware. Uh, but again, you can see here that antivirus labels are a very good source of all the types of labeling we're trying to collect here. So we can see here that um, they're good for identifying malware behavior, the target platform. And then later we'll show you that in more limited cases, certain antivirus products can detect um, and label by vulnerability or by packer. But the most common ones are by behavior and by platform. So our goal for this is can we summarize and clean up these antivirus scan reports um, in order to get labels and tags for malware that have high confidence. So this, this kind of becomes a large data cleaning problem. Um, any questions up to this point about like what goes into an antivirus scan report or um, kind of what our methodology is? Okay. Um, so there are prior antivirus-based malware tagging tools that are meant to do some or all of this, this problem. Um, one of the earliest ones was um, called Euphony, which was meant for um, meant for labeling Android malware, but it only labeled based on malware behavior. Smart was the method used by the um, by the Sorel data set I mentioned earlier, which only outputs eleven different behavioral tags. Um, the main work we're going to be focusing on is probably the best known, called AV Class Two, um, an update to the well-known AV Class malware tagger. Um, which can tag by all four of the categories that um, we're focusing on, but we'll be comparing the tool we developed with AV Class 2 and showing notable areas of improvement against it. There are other taggers that can tag by things like malware family, which is not our current focus, but something we're trying to expand our research into later. Um, so we made our own tool. We call it Clarify for clarifying antivirus labels. Um, and essentially, our goal is to offer improvements over AV Class 2 um, in order to uh, improve the parsing quality of the antivirus labels. So parsing out and identify, um, you know, is this token a behavior or a family or um, like a packer or vulnerability? Um, we want to improve how we detect um, tokens that mean the same thing, so detecting aliases, and also improving um, kind of how we do voting and, and outputting labels, especially in cases where antivirus products have correlations between them, which we'll talk about later. Um, so to build our data set, we used our, the tool we created called Clarify, um, and we collected 40 million antivirus scan reports from VirusTotal. Uh, VirusTotal is a, um, an online platform that will scan malware with about 70 different antivirus products. Um, so we have 40 million of these scan reports, and we use that for creating our data set. So we'll first introduce how our tool works uh, and then the data set contents and some of our evaluation. And that'll be the plan for the rest of the talk. Um, so kind of the thousand foot view of how our tool works. Um, we begin with just raw antivirus scan data, in our case from VirusTotal as input. We have a large collection of different parsers that can parse out antivirus labels, it understands their formats, it can take that and assign different parts of speech to each of the tokens in um, an antivirus label. From there, um, we kind of build up, um, you know, for a certain token, is there a, um, you know, is it always assigned as like a behavior indicating token or a, a vulnerability token, um, and build up a, um, basically a large vocabulary um, we also, from there, will identify if any two tokens mean the same thing. Like, for example, ransom and ransomware mean the same thing, but different antiviruses may use the same or different words for them. Finally, after that, we update our parsing. So this updates. Um, we now may know 
um, certain tokens always belong to this, you know, part of speech in our vocabulary. So like ransom always is a behavior. Um, we also may know at this point that we've figured out all of our aliases. So we're going to reparse the entire data set. Um, from there, we're going to go to our final ranking phase, which will take into account things like correlations between antivirus products and tell us how many antivirus products voted for each um, different tag. And I'll be breaking down each of these uh, slide by slide to kind of give you a better understanding. Um, so first of all, to show you all of the different like types of speech or parts of speech we identify in antivirus labels, we identify tokens that indicate things like the malware's behavior or category. Um, we identify tokens that tell us like the target operating system, the file format like Win32, um, or the programming language like C, C++, Go, um, you know, et cetera. Or things like, is it HTML? Is it an Office document? Is it, uh, is it a PDF? From there, we have another category which identifies vulnerabilities. So we can identify tokens indicating a vulnerability or an exploit. Um, we have the ability to identify tokens that are um, indicating the names of packers. And we can also find um, locations in an antivirus label that indicate the malware family. And then we have some special types of tokens. We mentioned the suffix. So there's often extraneous information at the end of antivirus labels. Um, often it will look like random characters or digits or numbers. Um, and it turns out that most tokens belong to this category and we're good at filtering them out. So these are things that our tool wants to get rid of. Um, and then we have some other special cases that are due to the way that we do parsing of antivirus labels. Um, we have a, um, a category called prefix tokens. So these usually appear at the beginning of antivirus labels. Um, we can't quite tell if it's you know, indicating behavior or platform, so there's ambiguity, but we definitely know it's not a malware family or a suffix. So um, we can't fully parse certain tokens um, due to ambiguity, but we do know it's not where a family or a suffix would be. And from there we can um, handle additional parsing in one of our later steps. And then um, in rare circumstances, there may be cases where there's positions in an antivirus label that we truly can't distinguish um, between the, the, what the token is uh, and we have to assign an unknown category to them. And some of our later parsing can help with this as well. All right, um, the way that our parsing works. So um, this diagram shows an antivirus label at the top ready to be parsed. Um, the first thing we do is we separate it by alphanumeric and non-alphanumeric tokens. So um, we tokenize it. So this would go into exploit, win32, MS08067 and XYZ as its tokens. And then the separators, the non alphanumeric characters, would be a colon, a forward slash, and a dot. So we can identify essentially the structure of the antivirus label, which is on the left. So it's a token followed by a colon, another token, slash, token, dot, token. Uh, we call it the, the antivirus labels format. And then all the tokens go to the right. So exploit win32, MS08067, which is a um, identifier for a vulnerability, and then the suffix right here, XYZ. So based on the format of the label and the antivirus that output it, um, we use that for identifying a parsing rule. So our tool Clarify handles um, a bunch of different parsing rules for antivirus products. Um, so this is an example of a rule meant to handle this particular antivirus label. So it takes in a list of tokens as input, and then um, runs a regular expression over it. So if the third token, so the um, at index two of the array matches this regular expression searching for MS followed by any number of digits. Um, we say that it's parsed as a behavioral token followed by a platform token followed by um, a vulnerability token followed by a suffix. Otherwise, um, the only difference is if it doesn't match that pattern, we know that a family token appears there um, instead. Um, so we essentially can parse out predictable antivirus labels in this manner sometimes relying on things like pattern matching or regular expressions in order to determine the format of the antivirus label and which types of tokens occur in different locations. Um, we do far more detailed antivirus parsing than any other tool in existence right now, uh, or any antivirus labeling tool. Um, so we support 882 different antivirus label formats. So for example, this is one format. We have 882 of these parsing rules, many of which are more complicated than this simple example. Um, so we can do very, very thorough parsing. Um, these rules handle over 90 different antivirus products, and we made sure that we're parsing the most common 
uh, formats that these tools use. So our full data set has over 1.1 billion antivirus labels in it because we have 40 million scan reports, each of which can uh, have up to 70 labels in them. And our parsing rules cover over 99.5% of these antivirus labels in our data set. Um, in some cases, I did mention that we have assignments for prefix tokens or for unknown tokens where we can't fully determine um, which type of token goes there. So, you know, we might not know if it's a, a category or a behavior token in some cases for the prefix. Um, and so what we can do is um, our tool, as it parses, it will track statistics about each token and how many times it's, it's assigned to each vocabulary category. So, like, maybe it's assigned to... Um, like a prefix token 100 times, and it's assigned to, um, you know, being a platform token 500 times. And based on those assignments, we can um, automatically assign like permanent categories. So like we notice that it's either always a prefix or a um, a platform token. So we'll assign it to being a platform token permanently, and this will update and keep us from having ambiguity when we parse again. Um, this also helps us be more rigorous towards um, future types of antivirus formats. So if an antivirus starts using a new format, um, even if we can't parse that format, we can make assumptions based on uh, other times we see the token being used in other formats. Um, next up, we have to identify tokens that mean the same thing, um, but uh, may be slightly different. So like ransom versus ransomware. Um, in many cases, uh, we'll see what we call trivial aliases. So, for example, an antivirus product will often like put some like random token at the very end of a um, or uh, like a random character at the end of a token. So, like you'll see like backdoor zero, backdoor one, backdoor two. We call these trivial aliases. So, we'll look through our full our full collection of tokens, um, and if we look at a pair of tokens T I and T J, where you know this would be two tokens in a set, um, if they're nearly identical in spelling, often just having like one character at the very end that's different, um, and they co-occur at least once, we'll automatically assign them as meaning the same thing because their spelling is nearly identical. Um, and we see both of those tokens at least once appearing together in one of our scan reports. Uh, again, these handle the very simple cases, um, like backdoor versus backdoor zero versus backdoor one. They all mean the same thing. Um, we also have a more complex category of token aliases, which we call parent-child aliases. Um, often there will be tokens that have similar spelling and occur, uh, occur with each other very frequently in the same um, scan reports. So this would be something like ransom versus ransomware, where um, those two tokens are mostly similar. They have similar um, you know, construction and spelling. And you'll often see one antivirus outputting ransom when another antivirus outputs ransomware, so they co-occur very frequently. Um, and we have a formula for finding these types of tokens. So of these, we will also track um, how often each of the tokens occurs. Um, so we call the less common token the child token, and the more common the parent token. And when we come to resolving these aliases, um, we'll assign the less common token um, to be renamed to the more common one. So for example, if ransomware occurs more often than ransom, we would rename all of the ransom tokens to ransomware after we've done the alias resolution. Um, so here's the formulas for how we find these parent-child tokens. First of all, we use co-occurrence percentage um, based on how many times each of them occur and how often they occur together. So TI would be the less common token, for example, ransom. TJ is the more common token, for example, ransomware. Um, the top term in the numerator describes how many times we observe both tokens occurring together. And the lower one describes how often we see the less common of the token. So for example, like... Um, if the less common token has the more common token in 90% of its scan reports, then we get a co-occurrence percentage of 90 or 90%. Uh, we also have a second score, which we call the edit score. This is based on edit distance and the length of the tokens. Um, so we will compute edit distance. So how many changes are needed to turn one token into the other token? We'll divide that by the length of the shorter token, essentially giving us like an edit percentage, and then we'll subtract one from that. So um, a score of one means that the tokens are completely identical, and a score of zero means um, you'd like have to fully 
uh, adjust one token to become the other token. We do have some other like special cases for this score. Um, so for example, if one token is a subset of another token, or if one token can be rearranged into another token without any um, without any character swaps, we do kind of boost the score slightly, um, but that's kind of uh, a little overcomplicating it. Um, so what we do is we do two checks. First of all, the, the two tokens must be similar enough in spelling to pass some kind of threshold, which we call E, which is 0.6 by default. Um, and then if we multiply together both the co-occurrence percentage and the edit score, um, that has to be greater than a second parameter, C, which defaults to 0.5. So essentially, if we have a really high co-occurrence score, but a low edit score, it'll still give us a reasonable uh, overall score. Or if the tokens are really similar, but they don't co-occur that often, it's still possible to succeed the check. So it kind of balances the two out. And this is how we identify tokens that are um, essentially have the same meaning based on the way that we see that they have similar spellings and co-occur frequently, if that makes sense. Okay, um, from here, um, at this point, we have parsed all of the scan reports, and we're basically going to count how many times each token occurs in the scan report after resolving aliases. Um, so the way we do just our default voting is we have parameters for controlling the threshold of the number of votes that need to um, be present in a scan report to assign one of the tags as output. Um, by default, these are five for behavior and platform tokens, which are much more common. You don't always see every antivirus product supporting um, you know, labeling by vulnerability or by packer, and you don't see these in every scan report. So we have a threshold of one for these. So you can see here um, that at least 12 antivirus scan, uh, antiviruses in a scan report detect this as ransomware, um, five detected as a worm, uh, there weren't any votes for a platform. There were two votes for a vulnerability called CVE 2017-0144. And then we saw that three antivirus products detect that this is packed by UPX. So just very simple voting for now, but we're going to make one adjustment for it that's very important, um, which is that we need to take into account correlations between antivirus products. So um, certain antivirus products are... Um, related in different ways. For example, um, some antivirus products have a signature base or an engine that they will share with other products or, or license to other products. Um, you can see from the image to the right that there's like a whole host of different antiviruses that use Bitdefender's engine. Um, and in many cases, they'll use Bitdefender's engine in combination with their own. And this causes correlations in the outputs of this uh, cluster of antiviruses, right? So you'll often see that like four or five different antiviruses just output the exact same later, uh, same label, I'm sorry, for a malware sample because it's the same one that was in Bitdefender's engine. So what we need to do is we have to take into account these correlations. In some cases, um, you'll notice like Aliac uses both Bitdefender's and Sophos's uh, engine. And then uh, Quihu 360 uses Bitdefender and Avarez engine. There's other cases where we have correlations. Um, it can be due to uh, two antivirus products is being owned by the same company. So, of course, there's a lot of internal sharing there. Um, there's public partnerships between antivirus companies. So, Zone Alarm and Kaspersky um, will share their signatures and labels. Um, and then, in other cases, it may be things like that an antivirus product was renamed from one to another, or that there were acquisitions where one antivirus acquires a second one. So, in these cases, we simply um, look at how many times. Uh, antiviruses in a cluster um, output the same tag. And if we observe multiple instances, we just treat it as all one label. So for example, if like five different antivirus products that use the same engine as Bitdefender all call a malware ransomware, we just treat that as one single vote. And that prevents like the double voting effect you would get from um, multiple correlated antiviruses. So that's how we adjust our output scores. And it still has to succeed that limited threshold to be counted as a tag. Um, so we did a thorough validation um, in the interest of time. I'm not going to go into fully how we validated our, our classifier, but it is in our paper, which will become public on uh, the 19th. Um, but when we were creating each of those uh, nearly 900 parsing rules, we validated every single one of the parsing rules against 10,000 antivirus labels in that format as we were creating them um, to make sure that they were parsing correctly. Um, we manually reviewed all of the 
Antiverse, uh, or I should say, we manually reviewed all of the token aliases and all of the common, um, like, tag assignments, like, you know, making sure that ransomware is truly one of the behavioral type of tokens, making sure that, like, Win32 is a, a platform token, and so on. So we did a lot of manual review to make sure that the output of our tool is correct, and then did some larger scale experiments, which compare the quality of our labels against AV class twos, but that's in our paper. Um, so from here, we used our uh, Clarify tool to create four data sets, one based on each different lexical category. So for the malware's behavior, its platform, vulnerability, and packer. And we did this by scanning um, a very, very large collection of antivirus scan reports using our tool. So we collected 40 million scan reports from VirusTotal. VirusTotal um, will essentially scan each malware sample with about 70 different antivirus products. And we um, these 40 million reports were from a data set called the Virus Share data set, which is a data set that um, is publicly available given permission to view the files from the owner. Um, so virus share is a data set that's also constantly being updated. Currently, every week or so, they upload another 65,000 malware samples, and it's been active going back to, I want to say, 2012 or so. So um, some of the malware in the data set is even older than this. So we actually have about a 15-year range of malware um, from between uh, 20 or 2006 and the present, I believe. Um, so actually more than 15 years. Um, there are certain tags that are too uncommon, so you'll get a lot of these one-off tags where only one malware sample gets a certain label. Um, and there's also certain tags that are very, very common. And so we had this issue of a large class imbalance in our data sets. So uh, we discarded tags that were too uncommon. Um, this threshold for discarding was uh, different for each data set. And we also downsampled by randomly selecting um, files that were tagged from tags that were too common. Um, so we came up with um, training and test data sets for all four of our data sets. Um, in total, we have over 5.5 million files between the four data sets. Um, and these are essentially based on how common or rare certain types of outputs are. So we have 4.3 million files tagged according to 75 different malware behaviors. So like, is it ransomware? Is it a keylogger? Is it a banking trojan? Um, we split these up into a training set and a test set. And the split was done um, as a temporal split. So um, all of the files um, in, I believe, virus share chunk 325 and before were used as a training set. And everything in later chunks, which is newer malware, was used in the testing set. So essentially what this does is um, the models that we train truly have to generalize to essentially future malware that doesn't appear in the training set. Um, and be able to handle out of distribution data well, right? So we can use this for evaluating how well would a classifier be able to predict the behaviors of malware for future unseen malware, right? Um, we did the same thing with the platform. So we identified over 43 different platform types of tokens, um, whether that's based on the target operating system or programming language or architecture. Um, in total, 963,000 files split into a training and test set temporarily the same way. We did a little bit different for vulnerabilities and packers. We had fewer um, instances of these types of files. Um, so we have um, 173,000 files labeled according to 128 different vulnerabilities. Um, these were done using a stratified train, train test split based on the class. So we ensure that each class of vulnerability appears in both the training set and test set proportionally. And the same thing with packers. So we had 250,000 different packers in total um, with 79 different packers among them. And this is done with a stratified train test split to make sure that there's instances of each packer in both the train set and test set proportionally. Um, from here, we evaluated um, all four of these data sets against different common malware benchmark models. Um, so Malconv, uh, the primary author is actually Edward Raff, uh, who um, is associated with UMBC, got his PhD here, and it's one of the current um, kind of prime models for doing uh, malware detection. So is it benign or malicious? But there's ways of adjusting this to be used for um, other types of classification. So we trained Malconv models on 
uh, all four of these training sets and then evaluated them with uh, the testing sets. And we computed the precision recall F1 measure and the rock AUC scores um, for, uh, for prediction, essentially tag by tag. So for each tag, it had to predict, is it, um, should it be assigned this tag or not as a like multi-label problem? We did this for both micro averaging and weighted averaging for uh, computing the precision recall and F1 measure um, because of the class imbalance. And you can see here that performance is very, very strong for vulnerability in Packer, um, which had this stratified split, but you'll notice it's much harder to perform these tasks um, for the behavior and platform data sets because of that temporal split where they have to be really good at generalizing to quote unquote future malware that's not present in the training set. So um, these benchmarks show that it's very challenging to do these tasks um, and the performance is much lower than um, for other data sets which have fewer, or I guess for the behavior data set which has uh, many fewer behaviors and there's no train test split. So this will essentially give us a more challenging benchmark which future models will hope to improve upon. Um, we also trained a light GBM, um, essentially tree-based model, so similar to a random forest, it's, it's boosting trees. Um, we trained one per each task, so it's a one versus rest classification challenge. So each boosted tree that was trained learns to predict one tag, and um, we use this over every tag and summarize the results. So um, for this, since light GBM is um, dependent on only PE files, we did need to um, only select certain types of files from our data set, so it's not the full data set. And we also were not able to accurately evaluate um, vulnerability malware because there's very few PE files in that. Um, mainly we're looking at things like scripts and, and other documents for the vulnerability malware. Um, so we evaluated the light GBM classifier only on PE files in the behavior platform and um, Packer categories. And again, you'll notice that um, we have very low scores for behavior and platform um, for both types of averaging um, in comparison to prior work because it's a more challenging uh, problem where we had a temporal split for the train test data set, but it still performs fairly well on packers. Um, so overall, to summarize our contributions, first, we'll be open sourcing our Clarify tool on GitHub uh, on the 19th. Um, this will really hopefully improve how we parse antivirus labels and improve how we do malware labeling for training and testing models. Um, we'll be releasing uh, our data set. So in some cases, we can release the full malware, in some cases, just the file hash and some associated information um, because we don't want to directly publish malware. But all of this is also um, available in the virus shared data set, which is public if you get permission to access it. So we'll be releasing the file hashes um, and all of the the tags for our four types of categories, so over 5.5 million files in total. And then for all of the PE files, we're going to release those as well, um, in addition to feature vectors from the Ember format, which is a common format for representing the malware for training malware, uh, malware classifiers. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions? Sure, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, since you're basing the tags uh, of the malware in the data set on the output of antivirus labels, uh, I want to ask mm -hmm. how, like, like how accurate are these malware scanners in uh, outputting like these labels? Like, like if it, if it's an antivirus that says that, like a piece of software is ransomware, how uh, like, like how likely is it to be ransomware? Because like if it's not very accurate, then I think that might uh, be an issue for the validity of the data set. Right, yes. So um, this is an issue. So there's been prior work on trying to quantify the accuracy of antivirus products. Um, individually, um, there is suspicious performance, and this is often due to things like these, um, like these, uh, um, what we call heuristic labels or generic labels. Um, and uh, so basically there's quality concerns both for individual antiviruses and the labels they use. But in general, um, the summary, kind of the overall agreement between antivirus products makes it a much uh, stronger source of labeling. And there's also really no alternative for this. Um, it's way too slow and like tedious to get manual labels at any type of scale for this. So almost every prior work is is based on 
agreement between antivirus products that are um, in these scan reports. Um, one of the main things that we did is, again, we tried to uh, remove any sources of correlation between antivirus products. And um, the, like, really the only like thing that some of the prior work does is they just get rid of like duplicate labels. Uh, but we went through and identified all of those sources of correlation um, and make sure that there's no um, kind of like double counts before doing our ranking. And we have a threshold for making sure at least a certain number of AVs have to agree before outputting the sleep. So these are all measures that we take to make sure that the confidence of these is high. Um, and then from there, we did validation um, against some data sets with manual family labels, uh, but that's something that was um, kind of uh, not able to be fit in the slides for, for the length of the talk here. But uh, if you're interested, I can I can send you the paper where we talk about how we check that these um, labels are valid. All right, uh, that's a good uh, response. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, one other thing that I guess I should mention is we have a future direction for this work, which is the final thing we want to do is improving how we do um, malware family tagging. Um, so getting the malware families accurately labeled is much more challenging than the um, the remaining types of uh, classification tasks we focus on. Um, it's harder to identify aliases because you'll find aliases that have completely different spellings. Uh, like, for example, in this Andromeda, Gamaru, and Watchos are all the same family of malware, just called different things by different AVs. Um, which is like you would not know that without. Um, like having other sources of information about them. And um, we also have to worry about much more strongly those generic antivirus labels. So um, that's kind of the current task I'm working on for my next work. Uh, does anyone else have any questions about this? Yeah, RJ, I've got a question. Sure. So you're producing this quite substantial looking data set. What is your personal hope for how people use this? Yeah, so um, essentially I'm hoping that one will open up more exploration of these less common malware tasks. Um, like right now, everyone's focusing on can we classify by non-malicious, which is very important, or can we classify by family? Um, but I want people to step back from family a little bit and just classify by what's the malware doing, which is a much more approachable task. Um, and I want people to be worried more about diversity in their data sets. So like I was mentioning, the Sorel data set only has 11 different behaviors. Um, you'll see people in academia evaluate their malware classifier on just 10 families when there's 10,000 out there and call it done, right? So I want to um, kind of raise more awareness of the fact that these data sets need to be more representative, have more classes, and worry about things like concept drift um, in uh, um, as things to account for. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? I have two questions. Um, so first, what advice do you have for um, people who make malware analysis programs to try to make their products such that they're easier to integrate with other products or interpret metadata? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I guess the first advice would be um, there's a huge issue in malware naming and, um, and, uh, like malware labeling. I was mentioning this alias problem where different companies call the same family of malware by different names. And it's, it's a hard problem to solve, right? There's, there's been people calling for this for a decade, but, but no substantial work on, uh, on unifying these names. And, um, the other thing is more transparency. Um, and this is something that's very hard because. Um, you know, one one argument for adding transparency and how we're getting these labels would involve the companies publishing like their signatures that are being used for detecting the malware. And as soon as that happens, the malware authors could take those signatures and um, just make their malware so it's not detected anymore. So there's this um, there's this struggle between transparency and between um, thwarting malware actors that keeps a lot of these antivirus products with, like a black box, and it's kind of just necessary which is the unfortunate reality of it. Um, my, my second question is, the work you're doing looks really useful and interesting, but it seems to be very heuristic. Um, have you made any attempt or thought about how you could cast some of these questions in a more scientific way, like 
have you made any attempt to find an optimal way of doing what you're trying to do? Yeah, so for now, a lot of it, uh, you're right, has been heuristic. Um, there's so much noise in these types of labels and so much, like, just bad data in them that it really has just come from a dating data cleaning perspective for now. What I'll be doing with the Maurer family detection um, is adding more of like a probabilistic model into things um, for for determining like how good are these antiviruses on a certain family, how good are these individual labels. Um, but for the four tasks identified, um, for now we just kind of want to get a working data set and fix these data cleaning problems first before trying anything more complex. It's important just to have clean data <laughs> and um, and uh, do better parsing of the antivirus label. So it's an incremental contribution. If uh, students are interested in this work and want to get involved, what, what advice would you have for them? Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, this is all work that was done with Dr. Nicholas's dream lab, the malware lab on campus. Uh, we have a really large collection of malware, including the, the 4 million or 40 million scan reports that I was talking about, as well as the corresponding malware samples. Um, so coming to those malware analysis meetings, which we'll have one today at 4 p.m. Um, so Dr. Nicholas's lab is a really good way to learn about these and get involved with other people doing similar research. So essentially, we really care about looking at malware on a large scale, um, looking at large data sets of malware and doing things like clustering, classification, um, data cleaning, uh, and um, and uh, tasks like that. So, uh, if it interests you, feel free to reach out to me. I can send you an invite to the lab meeting at four, and everyone is welcome to that. Uh, it's fairly informal, and uh, we'll do things like discussing our papers, talking about the research we're working on, and brainstorming. Well, thank you very much. Um, enjoyed your talk. We'll be back on the 20th when Josh Benelow from Microsoft will describe their work on Election Guard, which is a new overlay uh, security mechanism based on end-to-end -end encryption cryptographic method that overlays other existing voting systems. And they're gonna use that in the city of College Park this uh, November. So in, until then, that concludes this meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab.